greetings in the name of the Most High. Ha, ha, ha. Well, for those of you needing to talk to me, I have been conspicuously or inconspicuously absent, and that's the way it should be. You should be standing up on your own feet, and um, those who had to come through the storm over the past 10 years will realize that we are standing on our feet after the storm, mainly due to our abiding faith in our Lord and Savior, but in the dynamic day-to-day spiritual war, we are given the victory time and time again. Through our, I can name a number of scriptures, but through our weakness, he is strong. He that's in me is greater than he that's in the world. This has been proven. Um, the wicked shall be cut off, but the righteous shall go on uh, like the stars in the heavens. Now go on and on. Um, it, 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 it's truly amazing, and um, there really isn't any end to it. Uh, as I said in Psalm 37, which is my... Fret not because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. You see, there it is again. There it is again. Don't be envious of the workers of iniquity. In the last podcast, we talked about the workers of iniquity and read from Psalm 37, but I forgot to inform you that the first verse of the entire piece starts right off with workers of iniquity all over again. So it's mentioned and then mentioned again and then mentioned elsewhere, workers of iniquity. And then we explained what the difference is between a worker of iniquity, i.e. this would be a person who goes to church, as described in Matthew 7, uh, prays, does many things in the name of the Lord, is an upstanding man or woman in the community, um, is charitable, is giving, would be seen by all people as upright and beyond reproach. Um, The workers of iniquity appear beyond reproach to our society. The workers of iniquity are covered. You remember how it would say covered by the, uh, you know, pastors would say, well, you're, I'm going to give you my covering. Well, that should be the, <clears throat> the, the, um, the first red flag that goes up. I'm going to give you my covering. I know it's not meant as an evil phrase, but I'm going to give you my covering implies that the pastor is somewhat like, well, let's say, is somewhat like the Pope or something. Uh, God, God's representative as far as you're concerned. God's representative as far as what you're talking about. God's representative uh, in your life. The place you go to get your covering. You get your covering and so therefore you're set because you have the covering of the pastor And when people say, I have the covering of the pastor, and that's enough, right away I see the workers of iniquity. No pastor can give you his covering. No covering by any man would be sufficient. When the covering of Jesus is available to all, it almost seems absurd to me to have a pastor's covering. Now, I know it's not meant that way. I know it's not meant to offend. You know, like a lot of things are not meant to offend. But it does. It offends the Lord. I'm here to say that as a prophetic statement. That offends the Lord. I'm going to give you my covering is offensive not only to the Lord, but um, pretty much to, uh, to anyone that is God-fearing. We, we don't take the doctrines of men We don't take the doctrines of men. We don't take the uh, the ways of men. We don't live in 
the world of, uh, of men, necessarily. We are, we are, if you will, lambs of God. We are sons and daughters of the Most High God, made so, made so, by our faith in Jesus Christ. So we are no longer born of the flesh, but born of the Spirit, which is the rebirth from a carnal creation to a, to a spirit being, not having a nice touchy-feely feeling like a New Ager may uh, describe after doing an OM meditation uh, for two hours with uh, the group, but rather it's a descriptive noun term. You are now born of the Spirit, thus to be sons and daughters of the Most High God, no longer born of the flesh, therefore legally, legally, um, legally no longer, um, how shall I put it? You would no longer be subject to the laws of the, of the earth in the same way, or the laws of men, or the ways of the world. For example, the world has um, various rituals that they do. For, you know, one, one would be they have weddings, let's say. And then there are such things as funerals. And then there are such things as <clears throat> graduation ceremonies. And then there are such things as um, uh, bonuses at employment. And then there are such things as <clears throat> plaques and achievements to be on the wall. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a little... You know, it always happens when I'm speaking with you. Um, the, uh, it just so happens that all these things that man confers upon himself, whether it be the, uh, the obvious uh, degrees, a degree, by the way, was something that, uh, that the Illuminati had come up with in reordering the educational system away from teaching the word of God and into teaching of various uh, skills and so forth to, to be sure... Excuse me. To be sure to vet people. To be sure to vet people um, before emancipating them into society so they could make sure that those people became workers of iniquity in their, in other words, the trades went from, say, the guilds, you know, to, to, to uh, the halls of learning, which were there to teach the word of God originally. And then the idea of conferring degrees and masters and doctorates and all that, this is an idea of man, and it's patently absurd. Absolutely absurd to think that if someone has a master's degree, that they're competent because of that. What it means is that they have played the game, and they have uh, learned to play the game, and they have abided in the game, and they played the game in their school, and they were conferred a degree, and that degree uh, gives them some sort of ticket to the world to trade with, because it means that, yes, they're vetted, don't worry about them. Don't worry, they're, they're vetted, they're working for Satan, don't worry about them. Lots of these people would be offended to hear that a degree would mean you're working for Satan. But it just means that we've, you know, this is not my intention or my interpretation, this is just a fact. We have vetted this person, and by conferring the degree upon them, we know they're reliable enough for you to hire because you too were vetted by us. We control you, we control the graduate, we control the, the, the industry, we control the temple, we control the factory, we control the, uh, the office building, we control the government, we control the church, we control the uh, whatever it is else out there. We, meaning we, the way of man, which is beholden to Satan from the get-go. Or if you like, be less offensive, it is beholden to the world and to the way of the world 
at the get-go. So we have uniformity and we have a certain amount of predictability so that men and women can emancipate through society and it doesn't just go to all-out chaos because we now have a, a benchmark to explain what uniformity and, i.e., conformity really is. And that conformity is the thing that vets people to earn a living, but it is a conferred upon by men who came up with this system of degrees, mainly largely in the 20th century, to um, be able to vet people that, in other words, not every company, not every going concern has the ability to vet a person. So that's what degrees are for. They vet the person before they get to the job so that there really are no surprises. Very few oddballs get masters and PhDs. Oh, they could be nerds. That does not mean they're oddballs. They could have uh, pencils and, and slide rules in their pocket. That doesn't mean they're eyeballs, oddballs. Uh, and I'm not saying that everyone that gets a degree is uniformity and conformity. And, you know, they're not. But they tend not to, to, to learn... Um, they tend not to go after, they tend to see that whole process of, is absurd. Uh, these are people who had, um, again, we talked about bowing the knee and not the heart. In other words, yeah, they played the game to get their degree so they could have a job. In other words, they could fake going by the rules long enough to be able to get something they could trade with so that they wouldn't be, you know, uh, so they could be employed, so they could put, uh, have money and have a great time. Oh, for those who think money would end their problems, uh, I have news for you. Money doesn't end, and I'm in a position to know, so I, I would say um, money does not end people's problems. Money compounds problems because money just simply puts another target on, on one's back, period. That's about, that's about it, and if you want to be, if you have wealth and want to be conspicuous about it, um, then that just puts a bigger target on your head. And um, a story of a friend of mine who uh, bought a uh, Bentley. And I don't know anything about the Bentleys or the models or, what, you know, the, the car thing. Um, the, you know, I used to know all that when I was younger. One day I'm going to have this, what, the other thing, you know. And I've, I've, I've gone through those cars. I had Porsches and whatever, you know. Uh, that, that was my favorite car, the Porsche. But I even saw that was a ridiculous, ridiculous pursuit. It was who had the bigger tires and who had, you know, that whole uh, sort of L.A. car thing. So I, I participated in that for a time. And I realized that, uh, you know, most of the people that bought these Porsches, not it wasn't me because I, I, didn't, I didn't go the standard route, but most of these people that bought these Porsches, um, you know, they would have like an apartment with, you know, they could barely afford the rent on, but somehow they had the port, they were mortgaged to the hill on the Porsche because they had to make an impression because after all, it's LA and in LA, it's really the car you drive and the, and the flash you produce. So you had a lot of people driving these things. And I don't know what the car is today. I mean, then, then that's what it was. And I, I suppose today it would be like some sort of electric car. That's a, the exotic electric car. That'd be the thing today. Right. Um, to show that you've, you know, you're really in concert with the greenies in the studios, who run the studios, and and it, and it just gets sicker from there. You know, it, it, how far can you descend? It gets, it just goes from there downwards. Uh, anyway, he had a Bentley, and it was like, I guess, it was a coupe, and it was the top of the line. Well, they were a couple hundred grand or something. You know, they're they're expensive. He was saying that you know he had to get rid of it because. He didn't know where he could take it. Times being what they are, things being what they are, it, just, it really just screams, oh, I, I have money, come rob me. So he had very few places he could just drive his Bentley. I mean, he should be able to have a Bentley if he wants one, if you can afford it. I, I don't see what's wrong with it. I mean, I personally don't see anything wrong with having it. If, if, if you know, um, you know, I know that... Uh, that David had nice horses, and I know that um, Solomon had nice things, and I know that uh, you know that, that, that other people gave away everything they had, and some people had some things. I, I know it's a, kind of a mixed bag with how the Lord moves people in and out of uh, money and whatever. But you know, if a person has 
disposable income and they can afford to go plunk down a couple hundred K on a, on a Bentley or whatever. I don't know. They're 250,000, I don't know, whatever they are, something that most people cannot afford. Um, in this day and age, it just simply puts a, a, a target on you. And so I, and I was asking, I said, well, then what do you spend your money on? Given the fact that now you have a lot of money and stuff. Well, besides the fact you have charities and things you give to, and that's really nice. That's great. But I mean, what, in terms of, since you can afford almost any pleasure, I mean, what do you, what do you do? And the answer came back, well, I don't know. I, well, I'm trying to figure that out. <laughs> well, then why make all that money? <laughs> um, and the answer comes back, oh, because it's fun or whatever. I, I don't know. You know, just, this is just a, uh, now I've, I've gone beyond that incident into a, hypothetical situation um and there are people and and people that listen to this program that have this issue um uh, of uh you know wealth and and experience the idea of you know being a, a target of uh envy class warfare um it's almost like uh you know or, or the the greater thing of the 99 percent. you owe me that whatever money is above what i have you owe that to me so the millionaires and billionaires out there, you owe all of your excess, all your income, in fact, except the a meager amount to live on, you owe all that to the 99%. And how dare you ever have, you know, had that as an incentive to work. And of course, if you remove that incentive, there would not be industry in this country. There would not be uh, the tech industry. There would not be entrepreneurship. There would not be um, a lot of your movies that you see. Without the profit motive, there wouldn't be probably just about anything that you can think of would be drab gray, doled out by the government, and you'd be told where to work, what to do, and you would live poor and die poor, uh, barely being taken care of by nanny government, who will then kick you into an early grave after you've done your servitude and slavery. And that's what people seem to be voting for in this country, and I have warned against it. I have said that the, cost, the price of freedom is precious and dear. We have risked our blood and treasure to be free, and um, we have spent it. And it will be a shame with all the amount of, of, of sacrifice that we've made that we go into that dark night of communism, into that dark night of Satanism um, manifested is communism. Satanism manifests all the... All, all the uh, Planks of what Satan would do to be in Satan, to be ranked, to be filed, to have your spot, to have your rank, to, to, to you know, to, to um, and to do that rank and file and to stay in that rank of where you were put by Satan and be grateful about it because after all, you have food on the table and you're not being harassed. It's identical to, uh, it's identical. Oh, yeah, sure, there's rich Satanists too, just like they're in the communist system, there'd be rich elites who would kind of always have money and the rest, you know, the rest of the, you know, 99.9% would not. Um, and that's what they're trying to produce now, Obama and company to overwhelm the system, a la Saul Alinsky. So all part of the uh, manifesto to over overwhelm the system, to be able to um, create a, uh, a situation of, of very few haves and many have nots to cause them to be dependent on the government, uh, bankrupt the capitalist system, take over all the industry, and basically dole out in meager proportions, because remember the elite has big appetites for pleasure, to dole out in very meager amounts of, of, of subsistence for people, uh, uh, causing them all to be on the dole, and then the dole becomes the yoke of slavery. It's identi it is Satanism manifested into the physical, I exactly. Saul Alinsky dedicated his book, as we've said over and over again, to Lucifer. Um, this overwhelming the system in order to then uh, take over the system and to end entrepreneurship, the carbon, uh, the um, uh, combustion engine, uh, i.e. gasoline, to punish the uh, oil and gas industry, to, to punish, um, you know, uh, anybody or anything that doesn't, you know, as, I suppose, vegetarianism and bisexuality and the end of uh, the end of actual um, marriage between a man and a woman would be um, announced. Uh, marriage between um, men and men and women and women, of course, would be upheld. 
And, uh, you know, that uh, it would just go beyond that to also uh, the die on cue would be no longer to keep people sustained in their 60s and 70s. We should really euthanize them in their 50s before they get diseases. That way the healthcare system would be intact. Uh, and that would be their, you know, before, before retirement. There's no point in paying for people to retire. It can get all the way to that point. And you've seen, you know, futuristic movies that, you know, describe that. And, you know, futuristic tales that, uh, you know, like Brave New World and so forth in 1984 books that describe exactly what I'm talking about. Um, because this has happened before under the yoke of Pharaoh, under the yoke of, you know, um, of various dictators throughout history. Under the yoke of Stalin, uh, there was cannibalism in the streets of Moscow. Uh, I kid you not. It'd be like having cannibalism on the streets of uh, Los Angeles or New York City, you know, people just eating each other. And the government having storehouses worth of food that could feed everybody, holding them back in order to get more power, the only way of which would be to starve the people intentionally and kill them. Further to that, plans of depopulation and nuking certain parts of the populations, pretending it's a real war when it's a faux war, giving the military unbridled police powers uh, globally, which is why you don't hear anything from the military about the unconstitutionality or the uh, treason of, of people like Obama and others. You don't see the military grumbling or getting upset like they, you know, or taking a tank to the White House and arresting everybody. You're not going to see that from the Secret Service or the FBI because they're promised um, great expanded powers when we get the new world order in. So they're going to be compliant. You know, um, and no, they don't, I, I don't know that these people have any conscience or sense or sense of duty or anything else. They're pretty much, you know, um, these agencies or these uh, feds are pretty much all part of the hive mind. And that hive mind will vote for communism. They won't call it that, but, you know, globalism, communism, corporatism, fascism, they will call for that every single time because they're promised power and more money over the people. Expanded police powers, expanded surveillance powers, expanded uh, powers to see what one is thinking, to surveil them online, to see what one is doing, to, 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 uh, you, you know, to follow them, uh, to, to send undesirable, to gang stock undesirables, which a lot of the gang stocking that you have is simply... Um, you know, coming from that, that dark place of surveillance and spying on uh, the government spying on its own citizens. They have the capability at this point to take any picture you take with your cell phone, anything you have on your uh, hard drive, anything that you have, if you're connected online, you don't even need to be connected online. They can get the information anyway. In your absence, they can turn your computers on and off. They can do all, they can do all kinds of things. You know, that's, that's all built in because they want to make sure that you're vetted back to the original point. The original point was that um, they conferred degrees on people to vet them, but that uh, ultimately isn't enough. We, the government, and others, the power people, need to get inside your homes and inside your heads and find out exactly what kind of person you are. To, and then that won't be enough. We're going to have to regulate you. That won't be enough. All right, we're going to have to chip you with something that changes your DNA and then mind control you through our, so that your mind, so your thoughts are completely 100% made by us. We're going to have to regulate every thought and impulse you have from cradle to grave. And even that won't be enough. And those who are deficient in anything must be eliminated from society. So the culling of the, uh, the weak so that we can just produce the kind of worker, the kind of slave that we really want, who won't think, who won't um, pass judgment on things, who won't yearn to be free as an individual under God, but who will do what the state tells him or her to do. And those are the kind of people that have been recruited for the last 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, whatever, into our agencies. And they, and they comply and they are, yes, very not just conformed, but they're mind control robots, many of them, who are you know, the bureaucrats or whatever, they don't question the morality of anything or any decision, or they would never question the president. And if he has the power, they would obey dutifully, even if he says, okay, go ahead and take those guns and kill these people, our own citizens, because they're undesirable. And it, it, there's a point where they would actually do that. We may not be there yet, but we're getting closer and closer to that totalitarian, dictatorial, fascistic uh, horror that would be human misery unparalleled, which is the goal, 
because the more human misery, people like Obama and Saul Alinsky and, and, and Stalin or whatever, the more misery they create, the more power they have as dictators. In other words, all, all, they have all the power and all the money and they dole it out so that people stay just barely at the subsistence level, barely alive. <clears throat> so this will satisfy, and this is the whole purpose of class warfare, to make everyone equally as miserable. The whole purpose is to say, we give up. There is no individual. We have to uh, be all treated the same way and have the same money and have the same outcome. If it, anything other than that would be unfair and the government should regulate it, that's where it begins. Thus, um, you know, winners and losers would be virtually eliminated. Wealthy and uh, poor would be eliminated. The utopia would have everyone equally poor but they would call them middle class and fine, even if they have to be in bread lines, which would be very important to produce obedience to the state. This is um, how Satan operates. And I just really can't imagine uh, how anyone would really... I, I don't see how anyone couldn't see Given the uh, situation going on now, it must just be that half the country is uh, in America is willing to destroy the other half in order to give the government all the power and out of envy and jealousy, destroy the other half so that everyone is equally on the dole and miserable as per the people that have decided they don't want to really participate. And that's a choice. But why does a choice not to participate in the system and to be in subsistence kind of living? I know uh, quite a few people that live on sub subsistence living. Uh, but they don't want everyone else to pay for their subsistence. You know, they forage and, and, and whatnot, and they don't want government handouts. They don't want, they don't want to really be a part of the system at all. And they're able to get by on almost pennies a year compared to other people. And they, some of them say they're having quite a happy life. They're traveling around in their um, vans and camping out at the slabs out where John Norton is. And, you know, they're, they're you know, going to South America. They're, they're doing whatever it is they do. And they have magazines and they have a whole community based on subsistence uh, existence um, on how to live on simply pennies a day, if that. That's a choice one makes to be a, live a more nomadic lifestyle. That's, that's, a lot of people have been successful with that. You know, it worked it, become successful uh, at how to uh, exist in the sub-economy. I think, you know, that's a choice. I certainly don't judge them what, in any way, shape, or form. Uh, you, you know, and I, and I, nor do I say, uh, but these people are better than people that, that are um, working or doing whatever it is that they do. I'm not going to say that, to say they're good and people, you know, working are bad. People who worship the system are not good. Those are the workers of iniquity. Uh, the system becomes their God. Money becomes their God. But the people that have made decisions to be, um, you know, I don't have much ambition in the world. I can tell you that. I, I really... Um, you know, I have my own industry. I'm you know, working on a um, CD project, which is, you, know, you haven't heard anything because I'm keeping this under wraps because it's a, you know, it's kind of like the difference would be between, uh, say, a studio album and a live album release. You know, what you've been getting from me on, you know, various tracks that I'll produce and I'll give away for free. You've been getting like, lot, you know, sort of quick, you know, tracks, a little snapshot of where, where I am and in, in the progress I'm making. In, uh, in the sonic formats. And, um, but when you do a CD project, you know, it, it's becoming, you know, it's an album. It, it requires, you know, themes and pictures and, you know, polishing to, to, a, to a, 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 a crystalline um, uh, glow. You know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's uh, everything is under a microscope. And when the production is done, then, you know, you put the CD on it, it, it fills the room because it's been, properly professionally mastered and you know it's uh it's kind of a big deal actually compared to say putting up an mp3 track 
putting out a single, you know, it's, it's, you know, I've, I've singles I put out like brother Thomas and I, um, you know, thunder and lightning. I've, I've had those, uh, I got that mastered and then, and then I did my own mastering cause I liked it better. But I mean, I use that benchmark. Um, and that's fine. But when you put out a CD, everything, it has to go to an even higher standard than that, because people are going to listen to that on their high fidelity systems. And it's not going to be like an MP3 and, and, uh, so you're going to you're, you're going to just work on you know half a year on just polishing it and making it an experience and in this particular project is I guarantee will provide an experience will provide an experience I'm you know producer on it so it will provide an experience and it will and it will create a spiritual experience unparalleled and un, un and here for um, the, there's nothing else I can tell you right now where we're at right now. There's nothing else like it. Not in all the world. I say that in a, in a good way. You know, I mean, God forbid we, we have another praise and worship album that's treading over the same territory with the same chords and the same instruments and the same rut <laughs> generation after generation, call it you know, contemporary Christian music. That to me is, uh, Slavery, that to me is of the day. And, and you know, and all those producers out in Hollywood and stuff to do Christian music, they're all in the same game as rock and roll. They're all in, in Satan's game. I mean, I don't know what people think. They think, oh, well, it says Christian on it and they're talking about Jesus, so therefore it's okay. No, these people have the same rules applied to them, the same vetting process so that they can be recording artists and the same hoops to jump through by these idiots that do nothing but <clears throat> go round and round in circles and think they're being musicians and composers and whatnot, and they're just lame. I, I just feel like committing suicide if I had to live like that. But with me, money is not the object. So if they're paying me a lot of money to produce records in, in L.A. of Christian artists, I think I'd put a gun to my head and blow my brains out. I'd... I'd I would just start mainlining heroin. I would do something like that because it would be just so fake. I just couldn't, in other words, in other words, it wouldn't happen. I couldn't, if that opportunity came to me, I couldn't do it. I couldn't sell out Jesus like that. Sit there with these fake people, you know, trying to like, uh, you know, because they, they, they couldn't make it in rock and roll, so they're doing the Jesus rock and roll. I, I could, oh my God, I just, boom, gone. You know what I mean? Uh, that I might as well just put the nails in Jesus hands and feet and and crucify him afresh. I might as well just go back to one. So how these record producers can do it, they must be really dense to sow to the system of David Geffen records and these other people. They must be absolutely out of their mind. And then they go to their churches and they go, hey, we're having a CD release and, you know, and then all the industry is involved and the Billboard magazine picks up. You've got to be kidding me. I disrespect those people because they're sellouts, because they do not get it. You know, and I don't understand why the, the money changer tables haven't been overturned, but it's, and why people that own satanic music outlets own Christian outlets. I have no idea why the means of production is all owned by Satan and then why people would go there saying, yes, but I'm doing it for the Lord. Um, yeah, I'm drinking the blood for the Lord. I'm fornicating for the Lord. I'm hurting other people for the Lord. I'm being a Satanist for the Lord. <laughs> Uh, how how far do we sink? I'm I'm always just outraged. I find a new level of of uh, working iniquity, and that's all. And that and that what I've just described about the uh, CCM music scene is simply the workers of iniquity. That's all they are. And um, you would be safer uh, doing heavy metal, ode to Satan every night, pierced, tatted. Um, you know, huge, I, please wear earplugs, uh, you know, because, uh, some, you know, you'll, you'll go deaf at those decibel levels. But, I mean, you'd be better off being, um, you'd be safer spiritually being in a heavy metal band 
that has got the whole, all the satanic trappings of obviousness, then you'd be in a clean, squeaky clean, um, wearing dockers and a nice, uh, you know, blouse um, uh, with just the right little gold cross around your neck and having, um, you know, your, your hair blonde and, and lots of makeup and, uh, and, and walking around, um, you know, you'd be better off in a heavy metal band with dark leather, tatted, pierced, than you would be in one of those squeaky clean Christian bands. I just laid on you a truth of truths. Me, I'm not really, the, the, you know, the truth is not welcome in church, so I, I don't believe that I would be uh, welcome in, in, uh, in church, and I, and I haven't been because uh, I wouldn't shut up. Oh, I would be if I would shut up and just, um, you know, take it and like it. But I've since a little kid, I've always been like this. You know what I mean? So I, I might as well put it to good use. I, I just cannot live in a world like that. How about you? I can't live in a world like church. I can't live in a world. The when I we toured all the churches. Um, remember the most? We, there was one that was completely infested with demons. I mean, top to bottom. Big time gospel church. It was a black church, and they're really you know in the gospel music and. Um, you know, great musicians and all, but uh, uh, the, the people were getting possessed by um, demons like like Allah Voodoo, you know, and dancing and falling in the aisles and saying they're being slain in the spirit. And they were, and they were, um, it was identical to demonic possession. I mean, it was because we felt it. We got so messed up being there because we were. And then they had the fake prophets come up and give people words, and it was just, it was literally unbelievable. And they kept people in there for hours. They kept singing and raising the roof. But, I mean, people got possessed and were actually writhing in the aisles on the floor. And, um, and we could see that it wasn't the Holy Spirit. It was, it was definitely, the, the, you know, the demonic spirit. And it had been a church where this woman had kind of taken over and, and she had, you know, she was really the head of it. When we were there, we caused a riff in time and space and... Uh, Things got upset to where they 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 uh, they dropped the whole uh, communion tray and it all went splashing and flying all over the place, and I knew that was because of you know what we represented there. In other words, so there was some kind of real chaos, and then <clears throat> that just made the warfare go ever higher until we started seeing demons flying up in the ceilings, and uh, we could see those flying um, lizards, and we got so upset with that we ducked out to the car you know the flying lizards when you start seeing those um uh what they would have called dragons in the past then it's like okay and trish and i both saw them and we immediately went to uh because we were just up against the wall we kept going church to church hoping to find brethren you know so we go to this restaurant i remember in pasadena and start just slamming the uh, chardonnay trying to get over what happened you know, and, and eating bread, you know, just being, just trying to anesthetize what happened. And, and, uh, and, you know, that, that didn't help by the way, that just made things worse. And, um, you know, tried to provide a Disneyland like experience to anesthetize ourselves from what, what we just went through in that church. And, um, and that was it. I think, you know, it, then, then eventually I was filled by the Holy Spirit. I just started preaching against Satan everywhere. That was in the year 2000. 1999, 2000, I was openly preaching the word um, and persecution was ramping up to the point where uh, those of you who have electronic surveillance, I was on closed circuit TV in LA where everywhere I went and everything I did was actually, people were watching it on television. That's the, I had surveillance in the car, in the house, the, the guy across the street had a, had a, had a grid in, you know, microwave thing that he was cooking us with every day um and was hit, hooked up to the satellites and you know and um you know there were mysterious cars it was just so unbelievable it was beyond what you you would call gaslighting those of you who were targeted individuals it was beyond that it was just so uh massive that that you couldn't even get on a plane and fly somewhere and if you got on a plane and fl flew somewhere they'd be waiting for you to go we know who you are and then, you know, immediately, um, I remember going to Hawaii and immediately to, to Maui and immediately there's 
people taking pictures of me up on this upper balcony in this hotel and, you know, out of the blue and then disappearing into the, you know, into this suite that was like $10,000 a night, mega suite or whatever. How'd they get access in there? So they took pictures, just boom, boom, boom. And they ran down the hall after taking pictures and then disappearing into the suite where they obviously weren't staying. It was on that level where there were like telescopes aimed on the hotel room. That was in, and, um, and, you know, people who are, you know, paid to uh, do and say different things. And you wonder, well, how could they be in, I didn't tell anyone I was going here, really. And the answer is because it's, it's demonic, because it's, uh, it is orchestrated on a certain level, and there is a technology to it, but it's beyond human comprehension. It's beyond what, I'll just put it this way, not beyond human comprehension, it's beyond, if you knew the technology that they had, you wouldn't be surprised. You wouldn't be surprised. And the thing is, is um, I guess over the years, and that, you know, that would be like around 12 years ago or so. No, no, that would be more, that was like more like 1998. 1998, 1999, so it'd be like more like 14 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, and, and then, you know, then don't be surprised when your food is poisoned. And, and, and then you, these are people that don't know you. And they're, they're running the game. You start, oh, you feel it. You feel oppressed. You feel pushed down. You feel sick to your stomach and you don't know why. Then you find out there are people like around you that are, that are, uh, doing um, street theater and gaslighting to you uh, while you're in an area where no one knows who you are. Um, and because you can't believe that could possibly be going on, you just take it on yourself and then go, oh, I'm, I'm messed up. So you go to the bar to try to drink it away when you're not the one doing it. And you can drink until you drown, but no, no amount of drinks at a bar... Is, it may make you feel a little bit anesthetized to it, but I mean, it's, you're, you're, it's not coming from you. So you're not the one, you just feel the oppression from it. But, and okay, so on a wider scale now, let's widen that. This gang stalking, if you will, or this kind of uh, targeted individual experience is now gone mainstream to where everyone is targeted in the same way. And if anyone start speaking truth, then the, the, the forces, these, force, these forces of orchestration and organized stalking get sent to that person. They could be a truth seeker, a Ron Paul supporter, a, a constitutionalist, a, a Christian, uh, a devout, you know, a Hasidic Jew. It could be any, any manner of people, uh, someone who thinks they're an atheist. They have ways of determining, you know, you, know, you have to understand from your birth, Satan knows who you are and what you're capable of. And, and furthermore, he knows what you're going to do. So he's, you know, done things like had King Herod kill all the, you know, uh, all the kids of, you know, all the boys two years old to get rid of Jesus. He'll do things like that. You know, that's surveillance, you know, surveillance, gang stalking. Been going on, there's, in, it's been going on since the beginning of time. You know, find out who the individuals are that are a threat or a problem. Oh, how do we know? Well, we just know. This is the one. Well, how'd you arrive at that? Well, we just know. So go ahead and organize your forces against that one. How do you know? Because we just know. Okay, we're going to do what we're told because we want to have food on our table. So just do it. And the machine gets cranked up and the machine is global. And the people that interact with you, they don't know you but they're all like on stage, like the Truman Show, and they're all playing a role because that's what they have to do to eat. That's what they have to do to live. They're doing their duty, you know, in the police force, and the, the police force of Satan, if you will. What Paul McCartney um, said he worked for the police department in, in the song, She Came In Through the Bathroom Window, which I suppose has something to do with um, sex, but uh, it's got something more to do with the um, the, the whole sort of global fornication, horror Babylon uh, vetted system that makes people like Paul McCartney into, you know, sir, sir, this or that with, with money, uh, Lucy in the sky with money, you know? Um, and so the police department reference in that particular song is, is 
shows that he, Paul, was a gang stalker and he had to do what he wanted because it's Satan's police force. You know, and the police were surveilling, obviously, um, you know, all people that don't join the collective. Whether you, whether you uh, fornicate your way into it, whether you um, kill your way into it, what, it doesn't really matter what method you get to get to the other side, but somehow you, you get through. And then, you know, as a young man uh, or woman, you can, you, you're inducted into the police department where you have to kind of, you know, survey the, the people who are not being collectivists, who are not getting with the mind control, with the connection, with the hive, and they would be the targeted individuals. And that's, how, that's previously how they were selected. Targets are selected by, their, um, by the connectivity principle. And, um, you know, the goal is to get everyone in so that Yahweh doesn't have to return to earth, that Jesus doesn't have to deal with the earth in order to uh, cut the earth off from Yahweh. So that's the reason for having everyone conform to the same thing. Not so they can all work at the factory and then go hate each other and uh, sleep with each other's wives and then go to war against other countries and things like that. That's not the reason <clears throat> for conformity. The reason is um, it's a vetting process much like giving people degrees, for the purpose of um, rank and file uh, uh, satanic demonic um, social structure that has been here from the beginning of time. And the people that are not sewing to that would be the targeted individuals. There could be a guy working as an executive in a company that doesn't know he's not sewing to that, but he suddenly notices that his whole life is ruined divorce, credit cards are gone, you know, not, you know, all, all of a sudden he's fired, he's not, you know, the, 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 there's no employment opportunities, he's going down, 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 he's seeking help, he doesn't understand, there's all kinds of people gang stalking him and driving him to the point of suicide or to the point of compliance or whatever, but they, in any event, he becomes targeted and so he loses the things he had because Satan's getting around because that's illegal, therefore the police come and they um, and they follow the person around and harass them. And, you know, they, they, the police are there to alert everyone else in the community, this is the one, this one, this is the one. And the, so when this is selected, then the architecture and the uh, surveillance and the cameras and the satellites and the electronic harassment and all those things come to bear on that individual because... But to the normal eye, this is very important, they may seem like just a normal, functioning, contributing member of society. They, they may have a degree. They may work in a firm. They pay taxes. They have kids. They have a family. But something starts going on. Out of the blue, they're selected as a target. But the reason is not because of what they've done so far. It's because of what they're capable of doing or the threat level assessment of them to the connected um, uh, uh, mind-controlled, hive, slave, uh, sold-out society. And the damage uh, assessment that they're capable of doing creates the level of target that they are. And that's the way all targets are selected. I just thought you'd want to know that. Um, I've been through this probably longer than anyone because you'd have to go back to my, uh, to my being consciously aware of the situation I would be 15 years old. I'm, I'm talking about the, right? And then you start talking about it, They say, oh, you're paranoid. You need to go to the doctor. You need to be locked up. Yeah, if, uh, we would have to go back to where I was like 15 years old where I, I had the bleed through. I had the veil was lifted. I saw what it was back then. And when I started speaking about it back then, they locked my butt up and they had me go to shrinks. To, to, to get me off of that idea. But I mean, in, in other words, I, I knew of its existence when I was 15. Meaning the gaslighting, electronic, uh, it wasn't the same with then with satellites, but it was, you know, the, all the following, the, what you call gang stalking and all. But in, in this case, it was also for the purpose of elimination, of getting rid of the target. 
people say, well, they usually harass the target, they steal from the target. Oh, women are reporting they get drugged, they get raped and all that. Dr. John Hall and Dr. Robert Duncan have talked about that. Uh, yeah, okay, but there's also suiciding targets. And I had definitely been um, through all that. And so I can tell you, I've, I've studied it. And all the rock and roll music back then, you know, the Sir Pauls, the uh, Bob Dylans, the, um, you know, Rolling Stones, and all these various bands, they were all giving lip service to it and giving a tip of the hat to it all. The Who, there's all these various bands. And the, the, the people that were involved in the criminality were getting bolstered ever so much more by the rock music that was telling them to be policemen to be fascists, to be hunters of those people that are not complying, to go bother them, and, 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 you know, even if they're bothering no one, and ruin their lives. And that they have done. And the amount of pain they've inflicted on other people is severe. And yes, the game, oh no, there's a bigger component. Tell them about that. Okay. The game isn't finished with the individual having their life ruined. The game goes on indefinitely throughout one's life. It's a game with a game board, like a game show, but like, like a horse track or like where, the, you know, where there's a board in another dimension where all the people and all the names of all the people on earth are there and they're following them. But there are a series of lights and a series of, you know what I mean? They don't have to have actual names. They have a, another way of identifying you. But... All the people are there and all the progress they're making or not making, all the, 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 uh, the, the uh, decisions about what to do and not do, and all these things are going on there. Now, where does Yahweh come in? Um, well, he thwarts it. That's where scripture comes in. Uh, the steps of the righteous are guided by the Lord. Because they will ask the Lord which step to take before they take the step. So they're guided by the Lord. People that are fervently in prayer and do what the Lord says can walk through this matrix unscathed. Walk over, as Jesus said, scorpions and snakes, unscathed. I'm a living example. By all intent, I should have been dead when I was 18 from this whole thing. That's why I, I, I you know, watch the movie Mulholland Drive every once in a while because it's classic. It's a little bit of a reap what you sow, but it's classic kind of like that realm is really spooky because there's all kinds of supernatural stuff going on to every targeted individual where there's psychic links and all kinds of people popping up out of nowhere. And, you know, it's, it's a very magical realm that's, that's horrifying and, and, and predatory against the person experiencing it. Targets are selected in that other dimension, as I said, and they're, because they know they're, the, the, the little board they have that they watch is timeless. It doesn't have a time like past or future. It's just the kind of soul you are and the, and the history of your soul and all that, uh, which is a, kind of a moot point because there's no such thing as history. But it's all there. And the, the goal of them is to, is to weed out... Uh, any individual um, who does not die and become um, hive mind collective, which simply means that you have, through trauma, died. You passed through the other side because you gave up your personality. You were given an oversoul. You became another kind of person. And that's the person that ends up living, where the original person becomes a host and is diminished to where they have no free will of their own. So they become kind of like back, they've been you know, tied up and put in the back seat while someone else takes over the car. And they're just watching horror <clears throat> as that car is driven um, right off the cliff eventually. They do what they're told because they don't want to be the targeted one. Be, due to fear, they don't want to have thing, their life ruined, so they go along. And, and, you know, the cowboy is driving the buggy, right? That's the Mulholland Drive thing, where the cowboy drives the buggy, and we're all on it. That's, that's how they think. So they uh, will stalk the ones that are, that are not behaving and not getting with the program. And then those are the people that eventually are suicided out to make sure that they're cults so that there's a, just a good supply of slaves that do the... And if they could ever get it to the point of... Um, 
100% robots, then Yahweh could just destroy the earth, which would then play into Satan's hand because he would have done his job of, of testing all souls and finding that they all failed. Thus, they, they could be then destroyed, which would be the goal. Now, Satan also called the destroyer. Anyone who signs on to that, anyone who gives up, uh, anyone who passes through the other side, of course, is slated for total destruction. The other side means the second death. The other side means the second that you blaspheme the Holy Spirit at that point, you're done. You're, you're finished. There's, there's actually no point for you to be on earth anymore. And of course, people that have eyes to see, as some of us do, we don't acknowledge that person as a living, breathing human being. We acknowledge them as, you know, a robot, yes. Some sort of controlled victim, you know, unfortunate, yes, but also we recognize how dangerous they are so that we don't want any association. We don't minister them to, to them anymore because they're already spoken for. They've already, once you're twice dead, that's it. That's it. There's not a need for ministry. And you know what? I cannot say that on the rare occasion one of these is actually repetitive. I've seen people that are slaves to the other side. I've seen people that are, that are uh, I'm talking about people who have embraced, you know, like John Kay of Steppenwolf and the song Born to be Wild. Um, Take the world in a love embrace. Remember that line from the, from the song Born to be Wild? Uh, well, that's what I'm talking about. And that song is, a, you know, it's, 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 it's a bit more than... A lot of people say, well, it's just sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It's just, you know, it's just kids having fun. Uh, no, no, it's... Um, I'm sorry. There's a very specific vetting process in, in the works there. And youth is uh, recruited as soon as possible. Any youth that does not comply, by the time they're, say, 20 or so, they're branded, and um, they're branded for life. Now, once you're branded, that means you become, you know, uh, that means you are uh, of no rank, and they can do what they want with you. You're like a free abuse victim, and they get to have fun with you. Once a person like that um, survives long enough, though, and thwarts them back, and, and if they happen to win the game, then, uh, which they didn't even know they were playing, by the way, uh, but if they happen to win the game, then they're given their freedom, then that branding comes off, and that, that is, uh, I'm telling you all this from the satanic perspective, not from Jesus' perspective, because you've had enough of that, you know, that the Lord will deliver. If they happen to win the game, though, they have to take the branding off. You become a child of the living God, they have to. They can have you targeted in a way, but they have to take the brand off. If you last long enough, I think they have a certain time limit. If you get beyond that time limit, and you know somehow you win, uh, like for example, I've won the game, but I didn't know that I was even playing a game. But it was all because of Yahweh, because of Jesus. And then I noticed, oh, so then they take that off. Doesn't mean it's not going to happen again, or other games or other things aren't going on. It just means, you know. That, uh, as Bishop Kenko said it was in my interview years ago, you know, like when a, when a witch gets a hold of you, and I've had this over and over again, you know, it can only go so long. And after like five years, he said, you know, then it has to come off. It can't be forever because otherwise it would be lopsided so much that, that the Lord's people could not survive. So Satan has limited powers, you know. But one of those is that power to enslave, to, to make you know, people into untouchables. In other words, you know, ne'er-do-wells to, to turn them into bums, whatever you want to call them, where they have cooties for the world. No one will touch them. You know, they could be uh, musicians. They could be writers. No one will look at their books. No one will touch their music. No one will touch anything they do. It's like, oh, it's dangerous. I don't want to, you know what I mean? That's branding them. But if they survive that, then, you know, obviously there could be a point where that oppression is taken off. And um, so it's lambs can win the game, but by the time the game is over, they're very damaged. I mean, you know, they're scarred for sure, but they're free in Christ. You know, the lambs of God. You win the game because there's a certain time where they have to take off. The, and, and usually these go on and prosper. They live long lives, but they have their season and time and, and some people longer than others. 
of, you know, they are put in the game to see how they'll do. And they prove themselves every time of being not of the world, but being of God. And because they are, then they're targeted, you know, and that's basically it. I mean, if anyone would ever be of God, even if they're the biggest atheist in the world, they end up being targeted before they ever come to know Jesus. And, and it all becomes, you know, and then they have to go through the, the, the time of Job. You know, a, a whole, it could be seven years. It could be 50 years. It's whatever the game is. The game, the, the, it's longer for people that are stronger and people that have more talents and shorter for people that are, you know, not, not able to even understand the first seven years. But it's all organized, and nobody gets something they, you know, I mean, yeah, you think, well, why are children born, and then they die, and there's malnourished. There's, there's all kinds of things that we're doing to each other here on Earth by not being brothers and sisters at, that, are, that are that's terrible. You know, preventing people from being able to live and make, an eco, make a living, you know, intervening and becoming, you know, you, know, you know, in third world countries and making them beholden. Yeah, just, it goes on and on and on, the evil. You know, you're killing people in the name of saving them, Okay. All this also is in the mix in reap what you sow. There's always a law of reap what you sow for everyone. So if someone, if you're in a game and they're oppressing you, the people oppressing you, they wind up dead, folks. They wind up not just going to hell, but their lives are cut short. They're put into poverty, sickness and death before anybody else is. They just don't make it because they don't have... Um, They've been coddled all their lives. They've, they've been on the, on, the, on the bully side of this all their lives. And when it comes time for them to stand on their own two feet, and, and what happens is as they get older, Satan abandons them, and then they become the target because they have to reap what they've sown. And when it comes time for their to get a little taste of their own medicine, what happens is they fold, they can't take it for more than a week, and they're dead, a lot of them. Well, I mean, I've seen a lot. I've seen the piles of dead bodies that... Were people that, uh, and then I've seen other people that oppressed me in my youth, and they're still kind of going, but they're becoming like mannequins. You know what I mean? There's like nobody home. That's also a form of death. There's nobody there. They're twice dead. You don't minister to them. You say, well, how do you know which one to minister or not? Because the Holy Spirit tells me. You don't go to the Holy Spirit before you minister to someone? Oh, well, then you... You could be blaspheming the Holy Spirit. You better be careful. We don't minister to the twice dead. I'm sorry. We don't minister to zombies because there's nobody home. I mean, what point would that be? Well, you're judging them as zombies. There could still be you know, a person there. No, there isn't. There isn't a person there. They're gone. Get it? Something else is in there that took over. Yeah, but they, whoever they are, isn't there. I'm sorry, but that's just the way it wound up. They chose, you know, to, to sow to the wind and they reaped the whirlwind. They chose the way of death and they wound up dead before they, their carcass was buried. They joked about it, calling themselves the grateful dead or whatever, but it doesn't matter. They're still twice dead. Dead, first, of, first death comes from just because we're born dead. You know, we're born basically dead in the spirit because we're cursed. Uh, if you look at wars, rumors of wars, starvation, if you look at human misery, you'll see that we are, as humans, are cursed. If you can't see that, you have a serious problem. Okay, so that's the first death. You know, and we owe a death, but I mean, it's basically we're dead to begin with. The twice dead is when you go beyond the threshold, when you have yourself embraced the way of death, then it's twice dead. It's actually, you know, describing the book of Revelation if you want to read more about it. It's really very logical. The twice dead have embraced the way of death in their hearts as God. That would be kind of like um, eating poop and calling it um, filet mignon. But that's what they do backwards. And then what happens is the Lord allows the soul to be scalped and another soul's uh, entity to be put in like a, a you know, another a, a discarnate entity of, of Satan's choosing to be put in that vessel. And that is what you're dealing with. And it's not human. To, I'm telling you, it's, first of all, it's not human. 
And, um, yeah, but Richard Wormbrand, he was tortured for Christ, and those people were really communists. They were torturing him, and they were making people, killing people if they wouldn't renounce Jesus and all of that. And it's like, well, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to say which one's become twice dead. You know, the only way I know is when the Lord indicates to me that they are, and you can test them, you know. And what happens when they're around me is they start going through um, shakes. They start twitching around me. And, the, and they start, their heads start twitching left and right, like a robot, kind of like on tilt. And they start saying phrases over and over, repeating phrases again and again and again. And they do this in not just my presence, but the presence of any lamb. They'll start doing this. You'll know that they do the same thing. When you see that, you know, you have to ask the Lord what to do. Usually the answer is, ah, get out of there, slip away. Yeah, but it's my parents, get away. But it's my brother, get away. Because you can see they're not human because they keep repeating the phrases over and over again. In other words, they're, they're not, someone can say, well, they're under the control of Satan, but there's still a human there. And I'd say, well, that's a distinction that I, see, I tend to take that to the Lord. There are people that are been sowing to that system all their lives and they're, they're like what I call the Laodicean, the lukewarm church, Depart from me, I never knew you. You who work iniquity, in other words, you who are part of that system that are working it for your gain rather than seeking the Lord for, for provision. Uh, those people, um, you know, there's some of them, they're up for grabs. It's like a, it's a mixed bag. Some of them are available for salvation, some aren't. But the distinction of twice dead, you know, when I see a zombie, for example, or... Um, a program, you know, someone that's no longer a human, but a program. And I, I've had that. I've had that throughout my life. I've, I've, I've known them. And the um, and Lord tells me, absolutely, um, it would be blasphemy for you to minister to something that's... Be the equivalent if I went to a funeral and I started ministering to the corpse. It'd be, that would be... Would the Lord be pleased with that? Or would it, it just be the most incredible stupidity or foolishness? Stupidity and foolishness. Okay, recognize there are twice dead or zombies. What do you think the zombie movies are about? They're trying to explain this reality to you in a fictional way or vampire movies. Same thing. Okay, I don't witness to vampires because they have already embra- they've made their free will choice as to whom they serve and the result has been that they have received within themselves the condemnation already. The apocalypse has already occurred with them and they have met their maker, so to speak, while being in the flesh, but their body has been allowed to be used on earth uh, by the, um, to be a fit extension, if you will, for the demonic realm, for the, for the principalities and powers of wickedness in high places, for this very advanced technological um, civilization uh, to be replaced with another entity not human and uh, thus um, dead because is there any okay let me put it this way is there any reason that you would witness to a demon or to say a fallen angel that uh, when the Lord has said there's no way back to, to Enoch we have that evidence or to an entity that is um, not of the Lord, because there are. I mean, the Lord's, you know, in a way created light and dark and all this. I mean, he's still responsible for creating everything and for all the things you see. But ultimately, he's, what he's collecting for himself are his children. He's not going to have demons there and call them his children. So is there, it'd be like, should I speak to the darkness and tell it to be light? No, it was made dark so that it could, light could be illuminated in the darkness. So dark is necessary to be there. I recognize that these people are necessary to be there. I don't say that, Yahweh, you made a mistake. No, I recognize you must have them there. But I have to be wise. He has to bring me up in my knowledge so I know exactly what I'm dealing with. Because, I mean, I'm dealing with the Word of God. And I'm dealing with um, 
I mean, I mean, even something like this. What do you think of this? And into who's, whatsoever city or town you shall enter, inquire uh, who is worthy in that town, then go uh, there. And when you come to the house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if the house is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not um, receive you or hear your words, when you depart out of the house of the city, shake the dust off your feet. Verily I said to you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than the, in the day of judgment than for that city. Doesn't that sound mean? Jesus just told you that if they don't receive your word, you depart and that you don't minister to them. It's, I'm saying nothing other than that. I've, I had this scripture picked uh, in, in Matthew 10 because it backs up what I'm saying 100%. You don't witness to a demon because they don't receive your word. So um, they're slated for judgment, for death. And there's nothing you can do. They're marked for death. In a sense, when you depart from them, you leave a mark on them. You know, we're, they're either tagged or blessed. When you're out there in the world, you either tag or bless people, one or the other. If you encounter them or they encounter, they come into your presence, they get tagged, um, if the Lord gives you a specific word, a lot of times, for me, it's always been like six months, and then the thing happens. They're given a word, they're given six months, usually, and sometimes to the day, and if they haven't repented by then, then they're gone. I mean, quite literally, in some cases. Uh, with Ananias and Sapphira, they were, they, when, when Peter gave a word, they were dead. He gave the word, they were dead, like that. So sometimes it happens more quickly. But yeah, you know, um, uh, death is one of the, uh, actually, that's the most merciful option. You're dealing with, this is not um, a little game or some kind of little, you know, thing you learn in Sunday school. This is um, a huge life and death battle here. And with people dying all the time, all over the place. You know, it, it really is fraught with danger. And you better be up on the word and be able to have to draw up a scripture just like I did just right there. You better be able to speak in good standing with the Lord. And that means backing it up with scripture. In other words, everything I've talked about today, you can back up with scripture. I mean, I haven't cited exact line and verse because um, most of you know, uh, you know, you know the, but I, I can just tell you that all the things I said today came from scripture. Because that's the only thing that informs me. And then I go and I back it up right here and say that, yes, there are people you don't minister to. See what I'm saying? But it can go even beyond that, where the Lord will say, I want you to go into this place and talk to them, or go in this place and give them a word to rebuke them. And usually if they get a rebuke, then they have, they're tagged, and they only have a few months to repent. And then, you know, I don't know. I've, so I don't usually look back, but sometimes I'm shown what's happened you know, like, whatever happened to so-and-so? And then you, oh, my God, really? Then you remember, oh, I gave him a word. <laughs> and, and other people were drawn to, you know, but I probably wasn't the only one. They were probably given several warnings. I've given people warnings to repent or you're going to burn. They just said the words just like that. You either repent or you will burn. I guarantee it. They laughed. <laughs> Six months later, they're dead. I just tell them, please don't. I mean, you can mock me. You can laugh at me. But please don't reject what the Lord has said to you through me. <laughs> you think God talks to you? <laughs> That's what I'm... I just pray I don't have to give that word again to people. But I, I hate seeing that happen like that. On the other hand... I've had people say, I'm just like you. I love Jesus. And it was all part of the game. Oh boy, now that was, that's where it really gets uh, tough. That's where it really gets tough, folks. When they imitate the whole Jesus thing, they imitate. 
and they bat, they throw around a lot of scripture and think that makes them uh, oh so holy. And they, and they put on the outward accoutrements of being uh, a Christian belonging to the club when they're not. These are very dangerous. You have to really, really watch. Because, see, they are used by the enemy to infiltrate your groups, your families, your friendship, your, to distract you, to take away your, you know. The, these are um, people that can actually make you sick, turn you into the authorities, bear false witness against you. They can create all kinds of misery. The Lord wants you to discern and detect who they are. They come in the name but they're not you, and they're not brethren. Understand? These are what I called the recent song, pallbearers. The pallbearers are following you. I did it in 528 Hertz. Again, they start, it's called, you know. And Paul, it's, in, it's, on, the, <clears throat> it's on the website somewhere. Pallbearers following you. Pallbearers shadowing me. They said, this is our life free of want and strife. But if you don't want to die, and then we'll, we'll, we'll blame the son. See what I mean? They blame the son of man. They blame Yahweh. They curse you. The pallbearers are following you because they're trying to put you into the grave. But it's a metaphor. Don't you get it? It's a metaphor. It's kind of a smart song, actually. It's, it's, yeah, because I'm using the same techniques with lyric and, and, and verse that they use, except I'm saying my thing and not their thing. <laughs> yeah, Paul Bearer is shadowing me. They said this is our life through, free of want and strife. Well, who would have a life? Who would be a Paul Bearer? In other words, people that put a Paul Bearer is someone that carries the casket to the grave. And then they say, well, our life is free of strife. Ah, who would those people be, right? And then they say, if you don't want to die, and that's symbolic death, the second death is what I mean there. If you don't want to de- die, well, then we're going to blame the son, Jesus. Ta-da! Genius? <laughs> no, just basic lyrics 101, just a basic metaphor. We can talk like that. They talk like that, we talk like that. Decide this day whom you will serve. Who are you going to serve? A lot of you are on the fence, I see. You're just not sure this is all real. Well, you know when it's going to get real, folks? When the, when the deaths ramp up. When, you know, war, death, strife. You know, it's get, you're, you're, we're all right now like the frogs being boiled in the, in, the, in, the, in the water. You know, you turn up a little bit. And the frogs don't know they're being boiled. Because you, you rise the heat slowly. Okay. So this is what America is, and this is what the world is. And, and, but it's about to go, because it can't be sustained, it's about to go off whatever manifestation they're going to have. The only reason it hasn't so far is because the Lord has uh, restrained the evil day from happening. He said, no, not yet. Remember the word I had for you? Not yet. Remember? I was given utterance, uh, I'll give it a prophetic utterance. Not yet. Remember? Then... Not rapture, but translation. The Lord will... Oh, would you be conscious of translation? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. I contend that we've been translated already since then. Without maybe knowing. Because we all think it's a continuous, contiguous life, but it's not. It's filled with many translations. Here, there, dialed a different, you know. The reality in <clears throat> today that you go to sleep to when your head hits the pillow by the next morning when you wake up a lot of times is not the same world. Have you noticed? Yes. Okay, so you understand the pliability of the world, right? It's, no, don't think about it too much because it's beyond our comprehension. It would just give you a headache. But I've had a glimpse of it. I've had a, I've had a, a view of how it works. It's not like there's a planet in space. It's like there's hundreds of trillions of Earths and hundreds of trillions of, 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 of uh, paths for each person that are being shifted to one and the other every day. And it's like, it's, I can't even watch. 
But it's very important. You know, you're up on the game board. They have you there, and you're going across, and there are all these lights. That's all I can describe it. And there's beings that are operating, and they look like, I suppose you would call them angels, and and then fallen angels, and then, you know, there's this whole thing that's going on. God creates light and dark, good and evil. You know, um, you know, he has he has not made a mistake. If you were to say it differently than what I just said, you would be lying because. Um, without this situation exactly as it is, the thing Yahweh wants to do couldn't be done. You'd be saying, in essence, oh, he created the world, but he never intended it to be like this. That's bull crap. That would mean he wouldn't be God because he wouldn't be omnipotent enough to, to, to correct. Uh, he'd say he's capable of making a mistake. No, he isn't. He makes no mistakes. This is all intentional. This is what the Christian churches cannot comprehend. But he, he cannot tolerate sin. Um, no, that, that's right. He has to make people righteous to, to have standing with him. Yeah. And that's what this is for. He's in the business of producing righteousness, and that's why we have the situation we have. Without this, he couldn't produce righteousness. Oh, did the light just go off in your head? Did that make you feel better as to what your purpose is on earth? What you thought it was about you and your job or whatever? Are you got to be kidding me? You're here as an ambassador of Christ. And that's all you're about. You really have no other. You could go do the businesses and talk to people and, and have your entrepreneurship or go work at the thing you work at and do whatever. That's fine. But that's like, do, are you here to go to the bathroom? Your job is like going to the bathroom. Are you here to go to the bathroom? Is that your purpose on earth to go to the bathroom? A lot of people spend a lot of time going to the bathroom. Well, that's good. I'm just saying, you know, I, it would be foolish of me to lay, or, or is sex your, like, like a lot of gay people will have their gay thing as that's their, that's their basic career. That's their, rather than, you know, uh, it, it becomes a big banner or something. It becomes like a reason for living. Are you here to be gay? Are you here to be a fornicator? You might fornicate, but is that your purpose? That's what I'm trying to say. Are you um, uh, uh, some sort of bean counter? Is that that's your purpose, to be a bean counter? A ditch digger? A cabbie? An executive? Whatever? Are you, is, that, is that your purpose? Or is your purpose um, something other than that? In other words, you're here, you do those things, you, do, you, you, know, you drive the cab to make a living, you go to the bathroom to eliminate, or you eat to, to get nutrients, but that's not your purpose. The purpose is, okay, while that's going on, then the purpose, the, that's going on to, to, so you're here, that gives you the ability to be here so that your purpose can go on, which is none of those things. You know, whenever I, I interact with people, it's like, um, we could be talking about something, you know, or even something we're doing but that's never what it is. It's that interaction between the souls is really what the Lord's ministering. You know, that's the purpose. To minister to people, to get on the right hand of, hand of God before it's too late. The time clock is your life. It's not necessarily the end of the world. It's the end. When you, when, when you die, that's the end of the world so far as you're concerned. It might as well have been the end of the world. So between your birth and the time that's the end of the world, which is the end of your life, um, something things have to happen according to your purpose and his purpose that must be fulfilled or else your life is a waste. You're not here to go to the bathroom and call that your purpose. And I suppose it, you know, in the end, it's going to just mean um, 
that we must uh, find out whatever that is and whatever the Lord wants us to do with that and, and uh, you know, be able to um, live in harmony with him, really, through this temporary flicker of an instant here, which I believe the purpose here is to be filled with the Spirit, to, to be born again, okay, to do the works of the Lord, whichever station of life he has you in, whether it's rich or poor, or mental or whatever, to he puts you in these various stations to do what it is you do in that in that area. And you know, in my case, he's put me around people that were actually hostile, horribly hostile, and 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 scarring and hurting and killing people. And um, I suppose my job was to to overturn their paradigm, to make sure that they know that they are slated for death and that they're going to burn in hell and, and, and with full knowledge of what they could have had if they choose to go on to death and be true to their schools, meaning to be true with, you know, to, if they want to keep dancing with what they think the one who brung them was. And remember, everyone that thinks they sold their soul, they didn't. Satan can't buy your soul. That's a ridiculous concept. That right there is a lie. There's no such thing, technically, as selling the soul. Can't be done. You can think you have and then obey accordingly, but but it can't be done. So if you don't get off that gravy train before your death, you're going to burn, baby. And you're going to rue the day that you didn't heed, and you're going to kill yourself over and over again. Because, uh, because of shame for having not made the simple choice for life. The common sense choice for the Lord. For Jesus Christ. For the one who died so that you could live. So you could make that choice. So you could be washed in the blood of Christ, which washes us clean. That blood is our washing. And I accept that blood, the name of Jesus, because I accept the standing of the Lord. He makes me righteous through the blood of Christ. And I believe Jesus Christ is the one who was sent by Yahweh, but is Yahweh. Sent to redeem. John 1, uh, the word is flesh, Yahweh. Regardless of how you want to divide up God between Father, Son, Holy Spirit, this, that, or the other thing, I, I think basically, you know, Yahweh And Yahshua means God saves. Yahshua, God saves. Shua saves. God saves. I believe in Yeshua HaMashiach. God saves, who is the Messiah. And he's sent to save me because otherwise I'm born dead. I'm born with a death sentence on my head. I am born cursed. I look around me, I go, oh, yeah, you're right, Lord. Humanity is cursed. It's not fair. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, so I'm born in that situation. Okay, fine. How do I live? Jesus, and once I accept Jesus, it becomes your life, your way, Lord, not mine. Uh, I shrink so that you get bigger, you know, less of me, more of you. All those things happen. And the ultimate people just become Christ. The people that are really with it, they just become Christ. It's just everything they do is Christ. Motivated by that. I mean, how many times have I worried about things? where that is just so carnal and so unchrist, it's unbelievable. How many times have I fallen from that knowledge that, you know, and how many times have I been in the zone and been truly blessed and tasted the word of God and lived it where just everything just falls into place and everything you do and say and whatever, it's all in the confidence when you have, you know, the other side coming against you and that confidence to walk over the scorpions and snakes. And it's just, it, yes, it's a battle, but it just goes like that smoothly. Because of willing to, because when you're in the way, God has to break you all over again. When you have your own worries and doubts, then God has to break you all over again. Then you have to have misery in order to break through that. You know, so it's like, you know, yeah, you break down to the point of nothing. Your ego goes, you die to self. And then living as Christ is going to be an enjoyable experience because it's game over. Satan can't control you or hurt you or do anything to you if you live as Christ, to live as Christ, to die as gain. So if you don't care about death because you're just living Christ, then what can they do to you? 
You don't care about, you don't think about poverty or death or sickness or any of that. So what can they do to you? Those are the only things they have is a lever to lord it over you to make you upset. You're free, in other words. It doesn't matter what strata you're in. You could be rich, poor, middle. You, you know, you can be uh, totally poor and be a slave and completely rich and be free and vice versa. You can be totally rich and be a slave and poor and be free and anything in between. It's a spiritual thing. It's got nothing to do with what you have or don't have. We're all going to die, folks. We all have a time ticking time bomb clock on us. Tick, 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 inching us further toward death. I see people that I hadn't seen since I was in, you know, a teenager. And their faces have wrinkles. And they have gray hair. And they got illnesses. Okay, get it? Tick, tick. Those illnesses and the, those wrinkles and the gray hair and, you know, not being desirable like you were or whatever... All that is just a reminder of what's really important. Tick tock, tick tock, tick, tick, tick. Here it is. Let's say we're all going to die tomorrow. What would you do right now today? If we're going to die tomorrow, what would you do today? Tick, 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 tick. So that's the deal. So you have a certain limited amount of time to get it right. And, and um, not getting it right or not making a decision means you've chosen the dark side. In other words... Since we're cursed and since we already have this mark against us, no choice means you've embraced or accepted the world and Satan and the demonic kingdom, and you're going to go with that. No choice is a choice for the devil. I know, but that's, see, because we're born under the devil. So no choice means you've chosen your master, the devil who's the master of this world. So that's your choice. By now, the churches who have been emptied out in America should have, you know, and, and foreclosed on, they should have realized you cannot serve two masters. That's my final part of the talk today. You must have realized that you cannot serve two masters, folks. The church could not serve the state, i.e. 501c3, and the people, you know, and, and the Lord vis-a-vis -vis the people, you know, take care of the people for the Lord, to be shepherds. You can't be a shepherd if you're beholden to the state. You know, in other words, you can't worship Satan and Jesus at the same time. And then they make their, their congregations do the same thing, which is why we've... I don't speak against the churches because I just, I just don't like them. I, I, I do love the concept. It just doesn't work. Because invariably, they serve God and the devil at the same time, meaning the, you know, rendered boot. These pastors, too, when they get around people like me, they get so mad... You know, you, you talk about people that they claim to be loving, they can't claim to be forgiveness and tolerant and all that. Oh, the, the, the amount of these people that just want to kill me, you know, if I speak truth to them and I tell them that they're hypocrites and they're, you know, basically leading their congregations to hell and they're going to they're gonna roast all the more because of that. They just absolutely want to kill me. They cannot receive a word from any prophetic voice out there. They have prophets that they have in the, in the, you know, I'm not saying I'm a prophet here like a, like a, when, when we say prophet, I think of Ezekiel or Daniel or something like that. That's a, that's, I think that's a different thing, but, you know, we're given to prophesy, you know, so when we're given, a, and I'm, you know, I pray that I'm not given a word too often because I can't take it. It's hard to give someone a word when you know they're going to reject it. You just go, oh, please don't do that. And it's probably rejecting it because of me, because of ego, you know, and pride. Oh, gosh, please, you know, right? And, um, you know, and you are responsible, Mr. Pastor, for your entire congregation going to hell, so you're going to burn all the more. You were supposed to shepherd them, not hand them over to Lucifer. They get so mad. But it doesn't matter if they get mad, does it? They're doing such damage to people that... You know, you, you, you don't care if they get mad or not. You know, it's like, once again, with the authority of Christ, you are going to burn, buddy, 
and you are not respected in the kingdom of God and you have abrogated your responsibility and you would be better off as Judas going out and killing yourself than having one more day of your stupid sermons. Do you understand? What part of that do you not get? You're done. Quit. Leave the pulpit or perish or be struck dead where you stand, buddy. It's going to get to that point where where that sort of thing is going to be happening like almost daily. You do not accept leadership over people as a shepherd who is supposed to be administering Christ, not in the place of Jesus, but as an extension of to the people of, you know, helping them. You know, and I'm not saying that the pastor is the shepherd, but shepherding is what has to happen there. And if the person is serving two masters, then you don't have the Holy Spirit in charge. So they're being shepherded into um, death and destruction and eternal damnation. And to me, there's no greater crime or criminal. There's, I mean, you talk about serial killers. These guys are 10 times, these pastors that are false are 100 billion times worse than any serial killer because they're killing everybody in their congregation who then think it's okay to be like them, meaning compromise with the world. They're, these people have no business being in a pulpit if they have uh, an affiliation, ranking, whatever, um, acceptance with the world. They're, they're just, you know, the book is very clear. To be a friend of the world is to be an enemy of God. It's just perfectly clear. There is just no other way to interpret the Bible. There is no other way. The church has done that by saying, well, if you're not in church, you're fr- if you're in church, you're really you know, a friend of God and you're not in church, you're, you're a friend of the world. They try to interpret it that way. There is, that is not the interpretation. That's not the truth. The truth is, if you, the individual, are a friend of the world, meaning you have some sort of thing going on, then, um, well, you know who you are. I saw these kids, you know, getting hooked up with the world when I was, you know, a teenager, and I, and they would tell me how great it was. You know, I mean, that's what I mean when I say the world, being a friend of the world, I'm talking about that sort of thing. Those are also called the workers of iniquity, coming full circle again. And I saw them, and they said, it's fun to be a worker of iniquity, it's, you know. It's fun to be able to kind of do what I want and have money and travel, and it's exciting, and it's fun, and, it's, you know, what's your problem? And, you, you know, you don't tell them, oh, by the way, you're going to burn. They start laughing. Because, see, they know not what they do. In other words, they don't realize that by doing that, they are condoning the death and destruction of innocent people from time immemorial. That they are signing on in blood with uh, an agreement to kill, maim, and destroy everything that is precious unto God. And that's why you have the abortion industry through the roof. It's nothing but grown since I was a kid. Because that is their sacred right. You know, and that's just one example. The church has done nothing about that. Zero. The occasional um, shooter that's shown up and killed the abortion doctor, zero. In fact, it's increased a lot more since then. So that kind of intimidation, and the Lord doesn't, you know, I mean, prayer is way stronger than some weapon uh, like that anyway. Um, Obama administration is trying now to get the actual abortion uh, uh, term as late as possible so the being is as conscious as possible of being sacrificed. And I think they're going to try... You, you, if, if I'm not mistaken, there's some kind of legislation out there that says you can pull the fetus out and kill it. You know, so they're if they could get to the point of actually giving the birth, because that's how the United States is sustained right now. Abortion and war. And those are the two things that keep it from going bankrupt. I told you, if the debt can't be paid, it's got to be paid in blood. So when Obama overwhelms the system, 
Yippee Kaye, he gets to go to war and kill lots of Americans whom he hates. Obviously, he hates all Americans. Even the ones who are dupes worshiping him, he hates them too. He's more in league with the New World Order, with the George Soroses and the, you know, it's the big new, you know, the, the David Rockefellers and the, and, you know, whatever, whatever other people we think are, um, you know, wanting to create a utopia for Lucifer. He's in with them. He's not in with the masses at all. He was groomed um, to, to sway the masses. The masses are stupid. I mean, the stupidest people I've ever seen are the Occupy Wall Street people and the followers of Barack Obama. These people are absolutely, I, I just believe that they are, uh, most of them have rejected, uh, by the way, most of the ones I've run into have rejected God, rejected the Lord, rejected the gospel. In fact, I haven't met one that hasn't. <laughs> and I say, well, you, you know, you're going to be twice dead. And um, you're going to burn, baby. And it's, oh, no, <laughs> you're just, you know, you're just a, you know, a political ideologue on the right wing. No, I'm not. I'm not on the right wing because I'm aware of right or left and that whole paradigm. I'm not in any of that. But people that are on the left uh, today are extreme. They are abortionists, warmongers, um, and they want the government to turn on their own people. And they are uh, advocating civil war and um, death to anyone who, you know, who has, uh, I suppose it's also death ultimately to anyone who, it, you know, follows Jesus. Because Obama, you know, just like in Daniel, and we haven't read that. I don't know why I haven't read that to you. But Daniel, he's just like that. He's does great blasphemies in sight of the Most High, you know, to the Most High in the sight of men as a leader. Barack Obama has blasphemed God as a leader in front of men, in front of the whole world. He has said uh, mocking, ins you know, satanic mocking insults to people that, um, uh, who are of the word of God. Now, as for the good shepherds, God, God's a good shepherd, but as for those people who are doing a good job with their congregations, and they are out there too, uh, Hallelujah. You know, you need, you must be under terrible, terrible uh, poverty and terrible, terrible uh, oppression. You, you must really be going through a hard time because um, the war right now against any congregation is huge. It, it, the fact that you're not underground is truly an a amazing uh, feat. It must be very difficult because you even have Chinese Christians praying for persecution on the churches. Not being persecuted. Um, in this country, we, I was raised with the idea that there is no persecution for Christian, for the followers of Jesus, that there is no persecution. That's what I was taught here. I was taught that if you follow Jesus, there's no persecution. When I looked around, I saw that people that said they were Christians, they weren't being persecuted. So I thought, well, there's... You know, it's just like Buddhism or any of the rest. There's no persecution. And that was my impression here growing up. Born in 1954, my experience through the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s formed my opinion that there was no persecution, which then I was amazed when I heard the Chinese were praying, the underground church there, was praying that, the, that if there's, to help the, the, the Christians in America by praying for persecution for the churches so the churches would wake up. See, once the churches are actually being persecuted, that 501c3 C3, C3 thing will go out the window. Once it becomes like illegal to, 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 to spread the gospel, and they're not allowed, you know, and they're, they're told a certain prayer, at some point there, there'll be people, well, I don't actually, you know, the, the, the Bible says they have to come out of the whore. The whore is the B system, which includes the churches. So they have to actually come out and be separate. So they wouldn't be able to, so there wouldn't be reform in the church. They would have to come out. That's what, that's what the book of Revelation says. They'd have to actually come out and be separate from it in order to be saved, in order to be you know, available for salvation in Christ. Right? Because if they were in, they would then be serving two masters, which means they really just serve Satan. So they actually, technically, legally, they must come out. 
and be unaffiliated and renounce their affiliation to the church. Protestant, uh, Catholic, all of them, they would have to come out and be separate or they're going down. You try going in there and ministering to them, they're not going to listen to you. I have the podcast. They, they find the podcast. That's, they, they find me. I'm not gonna, I don't take it to them. Lord forbids that. They find me. I don't have to go find them. I mean, this is the age of technology. They're going to find this word to be a welcome, either a welcome fresh breeze, breeze of fresh air or to be something that's so horrifying they can't take it. I just, you know, I'll just tell you, you know, if you don't get right with the Lord, you know, and it doesn't matter what your station, if you're 1%, 99%, it doesn't matter. If you don't get right, you're gonna burn, period. And that means that there is no It's a more impersonal when you get to the actual meaning of it, meaning, you know, the crop didn't come up. It, it's just plowed under. Does anyone really remember the crop, that the, 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 the strand of wheat that didn't come up? See what I mean? We too, put too much anthropocentric importance on it. It's not personal with God. He's no respecter of persons. It's an impersonal process. We're, we're personalizing it, but it's more impersonal than that. It's that, you know, it didn't come up, and, but he, he's focusing on what does come up, not what doesn't. And that's what gets focused on in the future, and the rest is forgotten about. See what I mean? Ooh, that's cold, huh? Well, Jesus is, is, is God on earth. How cold was he? Let the dead bury the dead? You know, uh, many here have said they've done all these things in my name, depart from me, I never knew you. I mean, that's, huh? If they don't receive your word, it's going to be better uh, for Sovereign Gabor than it will be for them. What? You know, fear the person not that, uh, that can kill the body, but can send your soul to hell. What? Send your soul to hell? Jesus preaching to the antediluvians in Hades. What? And, 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 you know, it's not appropriate to say, well, I'm setting that paradigm aside. I don't believe in that paradigm. Well, okay, we don't believe in that paradigm. Uh, it's not a paradigm. The same, you know, I mean, could we examine ourselves and say, are we prejudiced from stories that we've heard? Not really. This is just basically truth 101. Um, God requires that you sow to the, to, the, to the spirit and you become alive in the spirit to go on as eternal beings. And if you don't, um, the way of flesh is death. It's just really, let's get down to that basic axiom. So it's not enough to just chase around um, money. But I mean, you could do it, but it can't be your first love. No, I mean, if you do it, make sure you're just doing it for fun, like playing tennis or something. If it becomes like an important life or death struggle, I mean, it'll just be, well, if you belong to the Lord, he'll just snap it away from you. If you fancy, if you belong to the Lord and you fancy anything above and beyond him and put too much thought in anything, he'll just snatch it away. You can never really be on your own recognizance because you're going to die anyway, so it wouldn't really matter now, would it? What matters is what you do to be able to die. And it's that simple. It, do, it doesn't matter. You could be a military general sitting there having um, you know, rack of lamb every night and ordering people dead to go die in the battlefield. Fine. If you got the Lord first, fine. Understand that. Well, if you're really with God, you'll renounce. No, because once it starts becoming physical and carnal, like the Amish, in my opinion, has become carnal. They renounce the world, but they're putting external physical uh, restraints upon themselves 
and considering that to be standing with God, that's BS. But if you're inspired to become a vagabond and you know separate in that way, and, and you really be called to that, fine. Someone else may be called to go into the uh, boardroom of uh, General Motors and and lecture them about uh, pistons or whatever and, and batteries and saying this is the way of the future of the new world order is battery power, and um, and 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 then they could be with the Lord and and possibly, you know. And yes, there could be leftists who are belong to God but have a confusion because leftist demands that a person is beholden to the state. But you know, there's all kinds of all kinds of possibilities. But at the end of the day, it's not what one does. Like I said, that's not going to the bathroom. Your job, I, I, as high or low as you think that is, it's just crapping. It's just going to the bathroom. It's not what you're here. You can do it, but what's important is what you're doing while that, you know, right? It's not that. It puts you in a certain position around certain people, yes, and then the Lord will work through you in that situation. He has it covered on all bases, including, and I know this is hard to believe, but at the very top of the churchianity system, at the very top of government, Etc. And at the very bottom, at every point in between, he got it covered, baby. Don't even worry about it. You're in good hands with all state. No, you're, you're in. That, that's a metaphor for God, right? The, all state's trying to play God, right? You're in good hands. The hands are the Lord. You're in the hand of the Lord there. He has to have us at every station in life in order to minister to all the people of all the stations. Otherwise, he wouldn't be God. Everyone gets a chance here. And, you know, the angels and everyone else is going, don't they know they're going to die tomorrow? Don't they know they're going to get sick and die? Don't they know that this horrible thing is they've got to get right today? Well, we're working on it. Uh, all the ministers have been sent in there, but, you know, they're not waking up. Don't they know that the plug's about to be pulled? Because, see, they who are watching us, they know when the plug's about to be pulled, and they start, they get all upset when they see we're just going right into the buzzsaw without Jesus. Anyway, that's my old-fashioned religion take. I'm sorry, it's just uh, uh, the truth. It's just the truth. And, and you know, for the, some of you have intellectual ideas about the Bible and different things. And those are fine, and that's fine to talk about all that. But at the end of the day, for me, it's just really simple. It's light and dark, and, the, and you know, well, you heard it. You heard me. I'll see you next time. Zeph Daniel, The Zeph Report. You never know when or where we'll be. Never know. Never know. Um, but just like Bill O'Reilly might say on Fox News, you know, the spin stops here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, the spin stops here, and uh, it has to. It's it, it again. It's a courtroom. We're in a courtroom, and we are the defendants. Okay, all of us here on planet Earth are the defendants in a courtroom. It's got nothing to do with your job, or what you think your family is or is not, or um, what your desire. It's got nothing to do with, you know, you're going to the bathroom. You know, when you come out of the bathroom, you're going to go back to the courtroom and you're going to sit there in front of the jury and in front of the, and, and the judge and, you know, and, and in front of everybody and, and, and you're going to be um, on trial. We are all on trial in a courtroom and people are going to come in and lie about us and all kinds of things. And with that, I bid you shalom, shalom. See you next time.